Hello and welcome to. Is that the intro that I usually do? No, I usually say something like "Hey, welcome to." I don't know. I don't have like a set intro. I don't have like a set intro that I do. I just kind of like say things that sound right. I guess like that. Would, that's just how I, I. That's just the first thing that always came to mind. It was just "Hey," and specifically that way, every single time. That's just how I said it. Uh, welcome to episode 47 of the Sourcast. Man, we're closing in on a, on a, on a whole year. Uh, yeah, you got, it's getting a little hot around here, so you might be hearing some birds in the background, like, uh, last time, I think. Uh, because my windows are open. So, uh, yeah, I think it's nice. Uh, we're gonna, what the fuck, did I have anything I wanted to talk about before I jump into, jump into the stuff? Uh, not really. I'm shocked that I managed to, I feel, whew, I'm taking the day to rest, you know, besides this, of course. <laughs> um, man, the fucking, the make my video, video, uh, God, that thing was... I just have bad time management skills. Uh, I basically... I uh, kind of worked myself to the bone to get that fucking thing out by Saturday. Uh, yeah, I basically put that together in like three days. Because it took me a while to like actually find my topic. Like I thought... Like I had to go through a couple different ideas and it turns out that a lot of them were like kind of dead ends. Until I finally found that, and I was like, holy shit, there's so much here. <laughs> uh, and then I basically, I took a day to write a script, uh, and then I edited that entire thing in like two days. And I was really tired. I'm still a little tired. Uh, it didn't help that I woke up and I took, I, I woke up like an hour, I, I got like six hours of sleep. And it was just one of those weird things where you, your body wakes up and you're just up. I'm like, okay. So, like, I, you know, I ate, I showered, I, uh, I got, like, breakfast and stuff. I, I already said I ate. <laughs> I took a walk. That was, the, that was the third thing I did. I did all that. I came back. I played Plus R for, like, 40 minutes. And then I was like, fuck, I'm tired. Oh, my brain. I just, like, hit the, my brain just hit the brakes. After, like, four or five hours of being awake. Went, took a nap, felt really good. Feel, still feel good. Still feel pretty good. Uh, yeah, the the power nap, I guess, is what you call it. I don't like just the body waking up an hour too early. Okay, all right, because I was I was tired after yesterday. <sighs> okay, so you'd think I'd want as much my body would want as much sleep as possible, but nope. Gotta get up, gotta get up, gotta get up and at him. I haven't even woken up at like 6 a.m. In, in a while, actually. I don't know why it was that early. Because <sighs> I went to sleep at like 1 or something like that. Anyway, we're going to jump into the comment review. Ooh. Our first comment comes from Lozy. He asks, I think it's been a while since I asked anything, so the random question of the day is, Pokemon, the Pokemon, or Digimon? Which are your favorites, and which games slash series have you played slash watched? Um, uh, you couldn't have known this, but this is not a great question for me. <laughs> um... <laughs> I have never played a Digimon game or interacted with the series. I have never consumed anything Digimon related in any actual way. Like I've seen things about it, but I don't know anything about it really. I vaguely know what it's about. And I don't really like Pokemon that much. Okay, okay. I should clarify. I should clarify. I like... Pokemon things that are not the games. That are not like the RPGs. I am just... Oh, okay, man. This is like a whole topic into itself. Why Tygen doesn't like Pokemon. 
which are your okay so which let me like and let me go through your question which are your favorites and which game slash series have you played watch okay digimon nothing i know nothing except i have a friend who was really into digimon because they had the anime on like dvd when they were a kid and so sometimes we'll just talk about it a little bit and the the intro digimon digital monsters like that um all I know is that, and that the movie that came out, I think, like, in America or outside of Japan was actually, like, three different Digimon movies just smushed together. And apparently that's why it, like, makes no sense. Um, that's all I know. And also that the soundtrack for, like, the American release of that movie has... That's a crit... Has Smash Mouth on it? Hang on. Digimon movie soundtrack. Yeah, but listen to the... The soundtrack to this, the Digi Rap, of course, All Star by Smash Mouth, uh, Fat Boy Slim, Kids in America by Len, uh, One Week by Bare Naked Ladies, the impression that I get by the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Dude, I love Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Never had to knock on wood, and I'm glad I haven't yet. Because I'm sure it isn't good. That's the impression that I get. That's a great band. All, all my friends are metalheads by Less Than Jake. Just like ridiculous. What is the soundtrack? Just what the fuck? Um, I thought Bowling for Soup was on there. I guess they're not. That would be perfect though. They would fit right in. No, they're not. Unless I'm... This is only what's on Digimon, or on, on the... Someone made a Spotify playlist, that's the first thing that comes up. Music from the motion picture. Yeah, okay, and then the rest of them is just, uh, Digimon soundtrack stuff. Okay. Yeah, um... So I have no opinions on Digimon. It looks cool. I really like the designs. They sound cool. I know, like, the idea... I know, like, the evolution thing. It seems cooler to me. On its face. Pokemon. I've played two of the games. I have to use the bathroom. Holy crap. I'm back from the bathroom. Uh, the only Pokemon games that I've played... Excuse me. Are Diamond and Emerald. When I was a kid, I had a DS, and my friend lent me Pokemon Diamond... Uh, and when, and when I was in high school, I played Emerald on, like, an emulator, an emerald <laughs> and, uh, I came, Pokemon Diamond made me think that I didn't like JRPGs. Yeah, I, <laughs> um... Like I, I, li I don't have a favorite Pokemon game because I don't really like any of them that I've played of the two. Um, Pokemon as a series... Okay, Pokemon as a game, as a game series, doesn't really appeal very much to me because it doesn't... I do like... I do actually really like some JRPGs. I mean, I love... I love Final Fantasy. I really like... Uh, why am I blanking on other JRPGs? Uh, I played like I, I love Persona. I like I really liked SMT. Um, yeah, like I I'm not like opposed to the genre like some people are. I do really like it, but my problem with Pokemon is that it doesn't hit. It doesn't. Pokemon doesn't particularly like hit on the things that I like about the genre, which are mainly. Um, honestly mainly is like story i i think that like the genre's biggest like strength i guess um near automata also counts as a jrpg although it's kind of weird it's not like a traditional jrpg um uh, my when i think of like okay well, why is final fantasy 6 one of my favorite games of all time it's like well the story is incredible the characters are super well written likable uh, uh super memorable uh there's just these crazy developments like there's some just 
gorgeous moments, just moments that almost made me, like, literally almost drew, d drove me to tears, and I'm, I, I don't cry easily. That game is just, like, actually gorgeous. Um, the music's great. Uh, the gameplay itself is pretty good. Uh, I really like action... The action... Oh, what is it called? Action Time Battle? ATB? Am I thinking... It, it's, you know, it's the little, like, bar that fills up, and then it's that character's turn. I really like that. It's a little, like, overwhelming at first, because it feels like stuff's coming at you fast, but uh, it has a great flow to it um, once you get into it. I really enjoy just grinding in that game. I, I'm, someone who, I'm someone who can actually, like, enjoy grinding in games as long as it's... I, I, as long as I enjoy the combat enough. Like, I love how every character in 6 has, like, their own, like little gameplay gimmicks and stuff and like unique abilities that they can do there's so many characters and you can like set like you can like customize your party and all that uh i always felt like motivated to continue the game and uh pokemon just doesn't really hit on that like First of all, like, people talk about, like, the Pokemon story. I understand there's a story in the Pokemon games, but, like, let's be real, okay? Let's be honest with ourselves. It's, this is not, like, the greatest, it's serviceable. The story in Pokemon games is serviceable, like, at best, from what I could tell, from my experience, at least. Like, it's, it's there because it, it feels like it has to be there. Maybe in the more recent games, not really, but... And, like, here's the th It's like, I really like the idea of Pokemon with, like, catching the monsters and making a little team. Like, it's cool. I really like a lot of the Pokemon designs. All that stuff is cool to me. But what I've come to realize is that I need goals, and I need, like, a motivation from the game. And... It's, I just don't feel it. Pokemon, like, doesn't give me a very strong goal to work towards, just personally. It's, like, beat the Elite Four and, like, the Champion or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, okay. Okay, well, a few things have to be, I need goals, and I need achieving those goals to be enjoyable. And I think that's where my other problem lies, is that I don't find... Pokemon's combat system to be very engaging. Uh, it's just extremely... It's, like, extremely turn-based. It's really easy. My One of my th problems is that, like, if I can find the easy way to do something, I'll just do it. I will just dominant strategy that game. And I remember literally just walking through Diamond with, like, just my starter. And it was cool for a bit, but, like, it just felt like there was nothing to it. And that's not, like, satisfying to me. I like it when games push me... I like it when games are difficult in a way that pushes me to be... To get better at them. Like, I... Uh, I mean, like, when I... The uh, most recent example I can think of is, like, when I went through all those boomer shooters. And I was playing, like, Ion Fury. And, uh, it was, it was, like hard it's hard and it actually like gets to a point where it's like okay like my my blood is kind of pumping actually sitting here playing this game because i feel like this like this like moving like like kind of burning sensation inside not literally but it's that feeling of like i gotta step up like if i'm gonna get through this section i gotta step it the fuck up and i gotta like manipulate enemy behaviors i gotta switch weapons to like based on the situation i gotta be really clever with like throwing grenades around corners and uh managing my ammo and it's like i feel like i actually have to improve at the game to progress and you know part of it's like i did play it on like a harder difficulty pokemon doesn't really offer that i wish they did um but also like i don't know it's I find the combat very basic. It's very like, okay, it's like an elemental system. Like, okay, Persona and SMT, well, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> also have that, except 
oh, they have, like, really cool stories. And, like, really engaging, like, plots and, and like, they're trying to say something. And that's, like, in, in all, like, I feel like if, if, like, SMT4 had a bad story, I would not, or, like, a boring story or something like that, I would not have nearly as much desire if it was just, like, hey, fight some demons. There's this guy that you gotta fight. I would probably get bored of it really fast, like I did with Pokemon. Like, I remember going back after after I got into Final Fantasy, and I was like, oh, shit, JRPGs are kind of cool. Um, I was like, let me give Pokemon another crack. And I always, I always really liked the designs from... What is Emerald? Gen 4? I think? Gen 3? Gen 4? I, I don't know. I really like those designs from that, that generation of Pokemon. I think they're like... It's probably my favorite in terms of just designs. Um, and so I like played it and I... Got, I don't even know how far. I got to like the area... It's like some tree houses you gotta go up and down. I don't know where that is. And then I just kind of got bored and I stopped playing. And then uh, like two years later I went back to it. I'm like, let me give Emerald another shot. And I got to the beach, I guess the water gym, and I think I cleared it. And what I realized was happening is I did all that in like two, in like one sitting. I got through like three of the gyms or whatever. And I remember just like grinding my, my team for a bit. And what I realized was I'm grinding. I was in a state where without even realizing it, I was, like, waiting for the game to get good. And then I realized, after, like, three gyms, I was like, oh. This is the whole game. Oh. I was like, I'm gonna spend the whole game waiting for it to get interesting. And it was just not holding my interest. Like, I'll give games... I'll give them a shot, honestly. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm very, like, willing and open to, like, okay, well, everything... You know, even if I don't end up liking something, at least I can, I can get something interesting. Even if I don't end up, like... If I don't like a game or a movie or a show or something, at least that like allows me to understand like my taste i can be like i don't like this because and i find that at least worthwhile like yeah the quiet man is a really really bad game but like i don't regret playing it because i think it was interesting if something's just boring and i don't find like i'm not getting anything out of it in any kind of way i just i don't really see a reason for me to keep playing. I do this with games I like. Like, I've dropped games that I liked because I felt like I'd just gotten everything out of them. I consume media in a very weird way. Um, other Pokemon-related things, I always thought the anime was cool as a kid. Um, Pokemon Snap is cool. I think it's a great idea. I liked the card game. I had the cards as a kid. Uh... Yeah, like, visually, aesthetically, like, the world of Pokemon, I find very f cool. I find fun. I think it's neat. But in terms of the games themselves, uh, they're kind of 0 for 2 in my ballpark. Yeah, I hope... I hope... <laughs> maybe that wasn't the answer you were looking for. <laughs> uh... That's that's the extent of my my. I've seen. Oh, uh, have I played slash watched? Yeah, I've seen the some of the anime. Uh, I don't know like what season. You have to remember that like uh, my childhood basically started around like two thousand seven. I was five years old, so whatever was airing around that time, it was the one with Dawn. Yeah, I think like like Diamond was Diamond was kind of like my generation's Pokemon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that 
That's my thoughts on both of those. Digimon looks neat. Never tried one. Pokemon, neat. I don't like the games. I think they're boring. Uh, my hot, my hottest take is that Shin Megami Tensei is Pokemon if it was a real video game. <laughs> I should tweet that. I don't tweet often, but I should tweet that. Um, because it's it's one of those those it's a classic. This seems like a classic Twitter hot take. Uh, <laughs> yeah. About Kojima's, that's also like the least, least, um, that's the harshest way I can put that opinion, too. Uh, second question comes from Gus. He asks, about Kojima's latest work, Death Stranding. Most of my friends that played it didn't like the game. They called it <laughs> Walking Mailman Simulator or a WTF fest. What the fuck fest? Uh, but I, re I really liked the lore and how he created something different where people can help each other. I don't really like games that have movie actors as a selling point, but I enjoyed the experience. I know you don't like open world games, but based on what you saw, what is your opinion on Death Stranding? I... yeah, so I have not played the game. You guys... you guys should go into, like, boxing or something, because you're great at, like, hitting my blind spots. Uh... I have not played the game, and I have not consumed that much content about the game. Um, actually, it's pretty funny. I just saw a post today on Reddit about how, uh, when the game came out, like, the enemy alien thingies, they're called BTs, the letters, like, BT, and... IGN put out a guide and it was called how to the thumbnail said like how to kill BTs but the entire thing was like capitalized so it said it read as how to kill BTS <laughs> and they had, to, they had to change it to like how to kill a BT <laughs> how to kill BTS <laughs> the IGN guide for how to kill <laughs> the IGN guide for how to kill BTS. <laughs> it's the fucking last. <laughs> Holy shit! I didn't laugh this much when I first read it. I don't know why it's so funny to read it. How to kill BTS. <laughs> <laughs> um, fuck. Uh, um, the most that I've experienced the game would be what they said about it on the Castle Super Beast podcast. I don't remember if both of them played it on there, but I remember Pat really liked it, or he liked it enough. And then the Donkey Reviews reviews because his first one was super negative and then the second one like like he came around on it like he he had a much more positive i don't think he like was super crazy about the game from what i remember in his second review but he he definitely was like a lot kinder on it uh he gave it a lot more credit I do remember, like, hearing about it and, like, being like, yeah, that seems like a game Donkey would not like. <laughs> and as soon as I saw his review, it's like, yeah, I could imagine just knowing what I know just from watching him for so long about his taste in games. Um, <clears throat> I have no idea what I... I don't know. I, it's, cr it's weird. I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't own a PlayStation console. Well, there's one technically in the house, but... It's in my brother's room, and I don't want to go in there. Um, yeah, it, it's like... <sighs> Why am I yawning? It's... I know that um, it's got Norman Reedus, and there's a scene where he goes... He's on a motorcycle, and he goes, Wow, this is just like... Being on Pride with Norman Reedus. <laughs> Which is really funny and feels like a joke that I would make. 
Um, I know Conan's in the game. Uh, I know there's a guy named Die Hard Man. And I think there's just a guy named Heart Man. And then, uh, there's the scene where the lady says... Mario and Princess Beach. And... There's a, there's a bit where uh, there's like a baby and then there's, I know there's a girl who's talking about being in the womb and you build bridges and make like a transportation network. It's like, you know, it's like Transport Tycoon Deluxe, but like a lot sadder. Um, and you, the game's about like making connections with people or something. Uh, I don't, I don't like forming opinions, like actual opinions if I haven't like experienced something firsthand. So I try to just like not form them. I, I try to try to keep like my opinions and what I've heard about something separate because like i have experience with liking things that other people really don't like and i'm like that's fair but i have you know my own thoughts and maybe if i only heard them complain about something i would have a, a totally different perspective of of that thing um i'm talking about bleach I'm talking about the fact that i like bleach if you can't tell so <laughs> you know it, it, it's like I try to keep my understanding of, of, of like games or whatever a little nuanced. Uh, and I try not to form opinions. I I don't even think I could yeah, I don't even think I could could throw out an opinion on it other than it looks weird and it looks like Kojima uh, it definitely fits the bill of something that it was like a project where Kojima had like no oversight and they just let him do things. Excuse me. Uh Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Um we're gonna move on to the first actual story of the of the of the week. I, this happened so fast, I didn't even get to report on the, on the initial, like, leak, supposed leak. So, Duke, New the 2001 build of Duke Nukem Forever has been leaked. Okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's take, let's take a, uh, let's do a little quick history lesson. So everyone remembers Duke Nukem Forever, right? That game... Okay, you guys remember Duke Nukem 3D? Everyone knows that game. And you guys remember Duke Nukem Forever, right? That game that... Sucked? That spent, like, 14-odd years in development, and then it came out and it was... Bad? Yeah, so if you've never seen, uh... The What Happened episode on that game, which I would recommend you go do. I think what happened is a great series. Um, basically what happened was after Duke 3D, 3D, the 3D Realms was like, let's make another Duke game and it's gonna be called Duke Nukem Forever. And that was literally the impetus was like, we wanna call it Duke Nukem Forever. And then they would like, okay, so they would like start work on a project on the on the game and then they would like keep so like George Broussard who was like the head of development would he was like the lead dev he would basically um do that funny thing that happens in game development sometimes where the like lead dev like goes home on the weekend and he plays something cool and then he comes back to the office and he's like we should put this in and basically uh they just had no solid plan of what the game was supposed to be and then like 
they never committed to a plan. So the game would just let they just toil away on it, just adding things and adding things and adding things. Um, and like slowly building it out in this really lopsided way. And then enough time would pass that they'd realize that, oh, uh, if this comes out in the next two years, it's going to be super outdated. We have to update all of our technology and all of our engines. So then they would switch to a new engine, which meant that they basically had to scrap everything that they'd done. So this happened like two or three times. And then they almost went bankrupt, and then Gearbox bought the, the IP, and then Duke Nukem Forever came out in, like, 2011 or 12. And it was bad. <laughs> so, back, way back in 2001, one of the earlier, like, there was a trailer shown off at, like, an E3 for Duke Nukem Forever, and the game looked like it existed, and it looked kind of cool. And so there is... It was confirmed that, like, there is a build of the game from 2001 that exists. That was never released, that was eventually scrapped because, you know, that cycle that I just mentioned, I just described. And, um... It's been basically lost media for the better part of 10 years. 20 years, actually. I mean, 2001. Um, better part of 20 years. So... It's one of those things that's like... It's confirmed that it exists. Gearbox has it. Randy Pitchford has it. Somewhere in his vault. It's probably next to his sex tapes. That he leaves on the table at the Medieval Times restaurant. Man, if you don't know that story, that's a fucking wild thing that I just said. Um, along with his stolen company secrets from Sega. What a ridiculous... Okay. Um, right next to the photos of him punching the voice actor for Claptrap in the face at the fucking Hotel Marriott. Anyway, um... So, it's been confirmed, and Randy Pitchford's like, yeah. So, people generally dislike how Duke has been handled under Gearbox, because it's basically been nothing. Except for the, what was it, the, the World Duke World Tour Edition, which was a re-release of Duke 3D. Uh, another re-release of it. There was the Duke Nuka, there was the, what was it, the Atomic Edition, I think? I'm getting a little mixed up on, like, because it got re-released a few times. There were already perfectly good re-releases, and they were like, let's take those off the storefront and put ours up. And there's going to be one new uh, episode, and it's, it's okay. And I don't even think it comes with, like, the expansions? Yeah, people generally don't like it. It's the, the Randy version. Uh, I think it's the one you can get now on Steam. So then Randy's like, hmm, well, maybe we could put it out. Maybe we could put out the 2001 build in, like, uh, like a, like a re-release or something. Like, oh, great, another re-release. Yeah, another re-release that you want us to buy so that we can play this one thing, actually, of a game that you probably already own if you're interested in it. That already exists. You're re-releasing a re-release. So that you can put out, like, a, a unfinished build of a game from 2001. So this has always been this... It's in this frustrating state of limbo. It's like, it exists, but we can't have it. Then suddenly, on 4chan, pops up this post. Let me see if I can find... Yeah. Uh, so someone named Exor, or Zor... Uh, on 4chan posted this, this, that it would, uh, okay. Uh, a bunch of, they, they got it. They got it. That's the important part. They got it. 
and they posted a bunch of screenshots with it from it with uh, some details. They said almost every chapter is present in some form. A huge chunk is playable. A huge chunk is block out, uh, block outs with no enemies. All of the E3 content is there. So everything from the, um, the everything from the, the E3. I have to change my font settings to read this properly. Firefox does this annoying thing with fonts. Uh, everything from the E3 trailer. Not just the editor, we will, we will be releasing the full source code. The full source code, too. All weapons are functional with the exception of the chainsaw and the freezer. Do you have any data on when you're going to leak it? June. The editor works. We also have the engine and Unreal Script source code and have written instructions for compiling it. Two builds, but the uh, only the content for one. It is Unreal Engine 1, like the final game. Was it real? Was the final game really Unreal 1? Jesus. There is no complete game. It was never finished. The E3 2001 iteration, but not the E3 2001 build. The shrink ray is in the game. It's the first weapon in slot 4. The theme is just the Megadeth version. Oh, so the, the Megadeth version of the, the Duke. It starts playing as soon as you boot the game. Bombshell is not visually present in the game at this point. There's a log file showing that her model was deleted. Huh, really? Um, hmm. Okay, so Bombshell is the character from uh, Ion Fury slash the game Bombshell, which was kind of like, oh, let's do like a female Duke. Duke Nukem. The strippers can be seen and interacted with when you first enter the club. By the point in the game that was recorded, most of them are dead. Cool. And there's a bunch of screenshots and actual videos of uh oh wait these aren't just screenshots they're actually videos holy shit some of them are screenshots um of like the editor and stuff whole like i saw this i this is so cool like this is so cool uh it's extremely complete there's the kick I'm just going through. I actually didn't even realize that these were these were videos and not screenshots. There's like a tank. Okay, it looks like yeah. The game looks a little little janky, a little unstable. There's like set pieces, like he's walking down a highway and like a car crashes into a thing, like a gate. Oh, and it crashes through the gate. That's super cool. Oh, there's oh yeah, rideable motorcycle. Does it work? It does. Uh. Yeah, the combat works. There's a bunch of different weapons. There's like... Wow. it's This is really cool looking. Uh, and then... So, it leaked out... Earlier than June. It leaked out... Uh, technically, like, a couple days ago. And people have already... I think there's something... Like, what is this? There's like... Uh, so, Neo Gamer, the video game archive has put out three videos at least and um <laughs> excuse me uh four video there's there's basically there's like an hour an hour and a half of content here uh i will link that it is super it's really cool um the game definitely, it's like, yeah, it's its its basically a bunch of unfinished levels, but a lot of the stuff is, like, functional. It's definitely, like, unfinished. Like, there's a ton of lighting that's just gone. It's a very dark game. Like, I, I'm sure some of it is intentional, but, uh, yeah, some of it just seems straight up too dark. Oh, there's a cute little reference to the original uh, movie theater from the first game. That's cool. There's like a, a pretty good it it what this seems like to me is it, it's like a like a vertical slice. If you're familiar with that. Uh, a vertical slice is basically what a, what a lot of like demos are at E3. Essentially the the vertical there's a vertical slice and a horizontal slice of a game. The horizontal slice is like one layer of the game all the way through. 
The vertical slice is like top to down everything that's in the game, but not over like any, not really like how it develops. It's a very like, here are the things that are in the game. A horizontal slice is more like, let's, ex it would be examining like one thing and then, you know, across the whole thing. And then the, the whole cake would be the game. <laughs> Just vertical and horizontal. So it, it, it seems to me like it's a like a vertical slice of the game in that like, well, first of all, you just have like every single weapon, which is probably like part of just like debug mode, essentially, so they can test stuff. But it seems like they were really testing out like, okay, we want it to be in this like general setting or these, these like settings. We want uh, these kinds of weapons. Uh, we want to have like a bunch of set piece stuff, uh, a bunch of like particle effects when stuff happens. We want it to be, you know, have that same kind of like s really cool cinematic, almost, I don't, cinematic isn't the right word, but very like, uh, like live feel. The world feels very reactive. Like it, uh, uh. They want the world to like feel reactive or like things are things are happening. Dynamic, I guess, is a good word for it. There's like picking up objects. Um, it's really cool. I mean, the fact that there is an editor, I think, is what is what makes this like interesting. <laughs> Something cool is definitely going to come out of it because let's see yeah so the the editor i mean it works and they have all the source code dude i don't know who leaked this i don't know who leaked this shit the game looks good honestly like it is like very 2001 it's kind of, it's a kind of low poly but i really like a lot of the texture work the textures are, are really nice actually like it has an art style in a way like i think it actually holds up okay outside of some of the low poly stuff um like all the a lot of the textures look um like photo is, there, is photo map the right word like photographed kind of like uh uh photographs like stretched over you know polygons and stuff it's really nice i i I find this just so so fascinating. I don't know if it's up for download. Can you actually download it? Uh, <sighs> DNF 2001 build. I think it's just, yeah, just free to download. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not a complete game, but I think it's probably worth checking out even if, if you're you know even, if you're even like remotely fond of the original duke 3d um just to see like what could have been compared to what was and of course i mean there, there's a the game's very very unfinished uh and, and in terms of like actual mechanics or things hey you know it could have gone either way but like um how do i how do i describe this dnf like the eventual duke nukem forever is kind of this weird amalgamation of a bunch of like really bad trends that happened in fps games in like the 2000s to the 2010s it's just like the most mediocre uninteresting gameplay uh stupid like turrets vehicle segments reloading come on you're gonna make a duke game with reloading uh and obviously, this would be div this would not have that. So it's just it's interesting. I'm 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 really curious to see if like, I feel like just because the editor exists in like a year or so at least, you're gonna see we're gonna see something crazy. Someone's gonna get into this and they're gonna do something crazy. <laughs>
uh, with this engine and the source code and all that. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a Reddit. Okay, I found a, found a Kotaku article. Uh, a Reddit user says, Now having had some time to mess with it, it's riddled with bugs. Most maps are utterly devoid of anything resembling gameplay. The renderer is glitchy as hell, though to be fair, this is to be expected given the age of it. Might be improved by uh, via something like DG Voodoo. Voodoo. And the sound only partially works, but the glimpses into what could have been are enticing as hell. I'll have to dig more uh, into this more later. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, check it out. At least check out the videos. I think it's cool to just, like, skip around. Holy shit, there's some... I just found out there's some drama here. Okay. Um, so, the founder of Apogee, Scott Miller, said, Looks... Like, someone leaked a build of Duke Nukem Forever from 2001. Anyone expecting much of a playable game will be disappointed. The game's brilliant trailer from that period definitely overrepresented what was actually playable in the game. George Broussard replies, Scott's a clueless narcissist whose actions are what led to the gearbox suits slash friction that led to us losing 3D Realms and the Duke IP. Mind-blowing the nonsense he spews? Oh, shit. Oh, I totally missed this. Scott wrote a post called The Truth About DNF. Uh, according to this article, laying the blame for the disaster at the game's understaffed and ad-libbed development. Um, and, uh, and saying a plan to save the project... By handing it off to Warframe developers Digital Extremes in 2004 was shot down internally, which, quote, turned out to be a fatal suicide shot. So Broussard says he's a clueless narcissist and he's the uh, mind-blowing the nonsense he spews, not surprising due to his depth of manipulation and narcissism. Least I've had the class to keep thoughts private. I have so much more to say on this, having known him since high school in the 70s? You can just see how he uses opportunity to try to make himself look better, tossing an ex-friend of 40 plus years and biz partner under a bus. Def a guy you wanted to business with. Holy shit. We've, uh... We've, uh... Ooh. Ah. Cracked my neck there. We've, uh... We've cut a window into some old beef. Uh, someone in the comments talks about the greatest Duke Nukem 3D map called Booga 7? What the fuck is Booga 7? Booga. Booga, Booga. Nope, that doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, sh pull up any results. Okay. Well, um... Yeah, check it out. <laughs> Next up. I just find this funny. EA's FIFA series loses its name after nearly 30 years. This comes from Ethan Gatch of Kotaku, who I think we've read before. We've read from him before. Next year's FIFA won't be called FIFA anymore, EA announced Tuesday. The mega sports franchise is parting ways with soccer's, or football's, international governing body and will be renamed EA Sports FC. But EA promises nothing else will change. Well, thank God. Thank God. Uh, yeah, so apparently it's going to be the same game, but not without the FIFA branding. <laughs> While it's claiming nothing will be lost with the shift from FIFA to EA Sports FC, the publisher is also pitching the new branding as an opportunity to create something new. Uh, the name change won't go into effect until 2023. There's no details about what that newness is. In the meantime, EA still has FIFA 23 coming out later this year, a full reveal, blah blah blah. According to reports last October, negotiations between EA and FIFA had gotten messy. EA want- oh god. 
EA wanted to expand the license into areas like NFTs, while FIFA wanted to retain more control so it could partner with other companies. In the end, it seems EA wasn't interested in paying the $1 billion price tag that was allegedly being requested to extend existing exclusivity deal. The existing exclusivity deal. In a couple years, we will likely get to see how the biggest sports franchise in gaming fares without its iconic name. Given, <laughs> given the corrupt mess that FIFA, the governing body, has been, the larger entity was surely getting more out of the branding deal than gaming publisher EA was. Um, oh, apparently uh, FIFA, the organization, is now working on their own games? Okay. The FIFA name is... They released a statement. The FIFA... I can assure you that only authentic real... The only authentic real game that has the FIFA name will be the best one available for gamers and football fans. Gianni Infantino remarked. The FIFA name is the only global original title. <laughs> FIFA 23, FIFA 24, FIFA 25. Wait, for how do you... Wait. FIFA 23, <laughs> FIFA 24, FIFA 25, FIFA 20, uh, 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 six, this <laughs> fuck. Uh. And so on. And so on. The content is the FIFA name and it will remain forever and remain the best. <laughs> Wait, what is the fucking. What is the fucking... I just want to make sure I'm not butchering this fucking... Brazil is campeão do mundo! <laughs> FIFA is campeão do mundo! It's not S, sorry. Brazil is campeão do mundo. That's the meme. <laughs> oh yeah, it comes from this fucking... There was like a Tumblr post, someone said, Brazil has nearly 60,000 murders. And it was like a, a a map of the world. And all of the countries like in blue have, uh, I think like less murders than Brazil combined. And then uh, <laughs> someone said, Brazil numero, 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 I don't know what one is in, in Portuguese. What is one in Portuguese? Um, uma and um. I didn't know they had two different for uh, masculine and feminine. I'll use the masculine because I'm a masculine guy. Brazil numero um de campeão penta. <laughs> Someone fucking replied. Someone goes, this is not an award show. And then so the guy replies, with, campeão do mundo. And then like three Brazilian flags and like the number one, like number one emoji. <laughs> oh, I probably butchered those fucking pronunciations. Uh... So, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I just find this really funny. I find the idea that, like, do you think they're going to get confused? Do you think that the FIFA players are going to get confused? They're like, what happened to FIFA? What if FIFA could, like, because, I mean, they just have the brand and they have the rights to the brand. They could just, like, start their own brand of like FIFA FIFA games call it that just call it like FIFA 24 and then do you think do you honestly think like place your bets do you think that like the normie casual audience it will would notice that EA did not publish it or do you think that they're like EA diehards I think they're like EA like dude I'm a real EA head I put the EA in head, dude. <laughs> a he head. <laughs> head, but the E and the A are capitalized. 
That's gotta be the fucking title of the podcast. I gotta write that down. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh. I just find that humorous. I wonder if, like. Like, how important. It's actually an interesting question. How important is the branding of, like, the FIFA name? Like, if 2K took their, their name off of the sports, uh, like, basketball titles, right? Like, would they sell as well? Or are people just, like, at this point so used to the yearly releases that they're, like... That, like, they... Would be totally, like... <sighs> Totally in like unfamiliar waters, having to like, oh, what is this? What is this now? I wonder. It's like it's funny because it's like the only. It feels like the only industry where this kind of thing happens. Like entertainment industry, I guess. I mean, are there, are there, I guess there's musicians who like get solo albums, or they there's authors who like write stuff under different names. That's true. I mean, right? Like, uh, like a. Uh, Authors who I feel like they when they write stuff under pen names, it's like um, it's not a, it doesn't get as much publicity. So I guess that the, there is like a, sort of a precedent now. I guess they're gonna EA Sports FC. What does FC stand for besides Free Company from Final Fantasy fourteen? Meaning I never knew what the football club. Oh okay. Oh, all right. I, I should have guessed. <laughs> I should have guessed FC. Instead for football club. I guess if it was SC, I, I could have guessed. But, like, yeah. America. America Gin. Uh, brain. <laughs> uh, Alright, well, I want to move on to... This might, hey, maybe, is this going to be... Maybe, is this, I wonder if this is going to be a short episode. Maybe not. The funniest news of the week. Play the song. Play the song. That's right. It's the Blizzard Block, baby. If you did not see this, okay, I really don't know, like, how... I really don't know how to, like, describe this in a way that does not sound like a joke. Blizzard... Blizzard revealed an internal tool that they use for developing characters. And it is basically a power ranking system for diversity. And it's really funny. It's really funny. You kind of have to see it to believe it. Uh... Like, the image looks like a joke. It's, um... Uh, uh, Zarya, Lucio, and, uh... Torbjorn from Overwatch. On one side. And they're each color-coded. And then on the left is a radar chart. With, um... What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different um, categories uh, that they all fall that they uh, that they are graded on, and the it is called the diversity space method is the name of this graph, and the categories include culture, ethnicity, age, ability, body type gender identity and sexual orientation uh, so from the looks of this zarya ranks around the in the middle tiers of gender identity and body type but not sexual orientation i guess she's not gay okay um she has like a Looks like I'd, gi I'd give it like a 2 out of 10 in the culture area. 
Ethnicity, pff, dude, straight zero. Age, straight zero. Ability, straight zero. Lucio. Lucio's looking rough, man. He's got, like, the same level as Zarya in the culture zone, but he does make up for it slightly with, like, a 5 out of 10 in ethnicity. Uh, so he is more ethnically diverse than Zarya or Torbjorn. Uh, that's kind of it, though. I mean, fucking Lucio apparently not gay. Uh... No, no points for gender identity, body type, ability, none of that. Torbjorn, Torbjorn's interesting. Torbjorn gets a solid, like, just eyeballing it, solid, like, 7 out of 10 in the age category. Uh, around that same thing in ability, because he has one robot hand. And I think he's missing an eye. And he has a, let's call that, like, a 5 out of 10 in body type, because he is a short man. However, um... Gender identity? Zero. And, uh, what is it? Culture? Looks like basically a zero or a one. Uh... The implications of this are hilarious in kind of a terrible way. Um... So they explained... Okay. <laughs> so... So they explained, like, what this is. Because you look at this and you're like, what the fuck? This is not ranking, like, the importance of any of these things. It's ranking the diversity of these things. So, basically, it's this tool... Excuse me. For numerically breaking down how diverse a character is in like the grand scheme of video game characters so i guess what they've done is they've identified cultures ethnicities ages ability uh, like levels of ability body type gender identity and sexual orientations that appear most frequently and then have set that as the baseline and the more that a character di diverts from that the more diverse they are in that aspect this is really funny um which led to let me pull this up uh, oh, I should have, I should have booked, I should have also, like, kept this. Um, uh, I have to, hard drive, hard drive, which is kind of like the onion for gaming. Um, or, like, parody news site. I would highly recommend them. Uh, fucking where is this? Oh, yeah. Activision Blizzard announces new tool to let players measure the craniums of characters. <laughs> and the image they used was just the same one that Blizzard did. <laughs> okay, I realize, I realize, I realize. Okay, I realize the joke. I don't know how well known this is outside of like America. Um, so there is, like, this eugenics thing that, like, you can measure people's intelligence based off of, like, their skulls, like, the size of their skulls, and there's this thing that, like, black people are inferior because they supposedly have, like, differently shaped skulls that mean that they're dumber and they're just inherently worse than other races. That's the joke. <laughs> measuring measuring the skull diameter. It's that's a pretty. <laughs> yeah, I love the fuck I love the headline that Fanbytes tweeted this out with. Activision Blizzard King introduces a diversity tool to rate character diversity on metrics like gender identity and ethnicity, and it's fucking weird. It is weird. 
Um, okay, so. Uh, um, this is so funny. So there were some leaked. Okay, so the the original post got archived. And uh, those original, I still actually, wait, I think I still have the, I downloaded the images. Where are they? Where is it? Um, I'll look through it. So they had, they were originally posts, sorry, images of like what this tool looks like. And then they took it out of the post because here it is because it looks really bad it looks really bad um okay so let's see okay so it's page for anna from overwatch these are all pretty much overwatch characters um because overwatch is supposed to be diverse so uh, so there's like a little, it's like, okay, her biography, like, okay, basically just her in-game information. Um, and then there's a bunch of, like, things on the side. So, culture, Egyptian, and then there's like a number next to it. Egyptian has a seven. Uh, race, Arab, age, 60. All of these have sevens uh, out of what I'm assuming is 10? Um, uh, what? <sighs> cognitive ability has, it just says reason? I don't know what cognitive ability, like, if she has, like, a dis- like a- if she's, like, dumb or some shit? <laughs> I wonder what Roadhog has. Um, zero. She has a zero in cognitive ability. Okay. Um, but it's, like, grayed out. Uh... Physical ability, one-eyed, which gets her a 4 out of 10. Body type, slim plus curvy, 0 out of 10. Facial features slash beauty is slightly aged, which gives her a 1. Gender identity, woman, which is a 5 out of 10. It's so funny. Uh, sexual orientation, heterosexual, 0. Socioeconomic background, middle class. Middle class people are not diverse. There is no diverse. Um, and then above that, you have that all on a, on a similar radar chart, which actually has things that were not shown in that, like, initial, like, if you look this up, you'll find the picture, um, with, like, the Torbjorn and Zarya and Lucio. This has, this also has, like, extra categories with, uh, it adds cognitive ability, facial features slash beauty, and socioeconomic background. This is like really funny. Uh, characters. Is there anything we can see on the side? Uh, okay, it looks like okay on the on the left hand side. It's pretty much just like a uh, like in game, like how they're categorized, like support, if their morality. <laughs> uh, and then we have this really weird... Okay, so there's, like, a thing for, like, the support role in general. And they have it broken down. So, like, all the support characters... One, two, three... How are there only six support characters in Overwatch? Are there only six support characters in Overwatch? I find that hard to believe. Hasn't the game been out for, like... Six years? Do they not have more? I, I always heard that, like, there's way too many, like, DPS characters. Like, it's super imbalanced, but, like, holy shit. I, I thought really... There's six? Okay. Do you think they're having, like, a Square Enix problem where Square just, like, didn't know how to design, like, support classes in 14? Uh, um, so yeah, they have it also split up by all these different categories. 
but it's like with a different it's like the 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 class as a whole and they all have like weird yeah it's weird fucking point values assigned to shit it's real i bit my tongue on the sign and it fucking stings all the time it's really weird. It's really weird. So, now thankfully... Um, okay, okay. So, where was the official post? Because there was actually an update. Yeah, okay. There's an update to... The blog post. Wait, I can't find it. Um... So they like updated the original blog post. Yeah. We recently shared a blog post that raises raised questions about how we approach diversity in a, diversity in our games. While the prototype tool has been tested internally, it is not in active use. Our dev teams have always and will continue to drive in-game content. Oh, I'm sure. We have updated the post to clarify the purpose of this tool, which is one small component of our broader D, E, and I, I don't know what that is, efforts, and is not intended to be a replacement for diverse perspectives. We regret any offense that the original post may have caused. Um, I feel like I shouldn't have to explain why this is weird and why this is funny. Uh, it's the it's the it's maybe the most <laughs> corporate liberal thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like this is like corporations have zero morality. Like they're like oh. Like, maybe, like, I believe that there's people on the Overwatch team who care about these things. But the corporations, I feel like once you get to a certain level of, like, wealth or class, you are, like, a different type of person. Like, you're playing your own game. You don't care. Like, it doesn't matter to you, like, what your own... Like, what any of your own, like... Your race, your religion, anything. Like, you're... you're you're in a different. T you're on your own team now, with your other people in your class. Like I genuinely think that like they do not give a fuck about any of this stuff, and but they know that other people do. So like common, the common folks, the peons, the serfs, they care about these things. They care about these things, and these are things that are emotionally resonant to them. So we will find a way. To mark, this happens with everything. This happens with all sorts of different things. Uh, religion is commonly used to like target people who are like more conservative. Like, oh my God, this is against your religion. Don't you care about that? They don't. The, pe the people saying that don't give a fuck. They just want you to vote for them so they can stay rich. <laughs> they don't give a fuck. I watched Rahm Emanuel like get reelected like three times in Chicago. That guy fucking sucks. He never did anything good for the city. He just kept getting elected. Why was he there for so long? Why was he there for so long? Um, oh, it's because every fucking election cycle, he would make like a sappy ad about him helping low-income communities. And then he would get all the votes from like the Democrats who are like 100% of Chicagoans. And then, uh, then he would get an office. Then he wouldn't do anything. He would just give the money to his friends and like pay off, try to pay off a little bit of the incredible amount of debt that the city had. Anyway, I'm ranting about other stuff. Yeah, this is like so transparently corporate an attempt to appeal to like like people. Man, corporations when the when the diverse when like diversity started becoming a thing that people cared about. I'm sure they were actually like they were so pleased because they're like. There's more people we can get money from? <laughs> every social issue... every It's like a Che Guevara t-shirt. Every social issue you care about will be commodified and sold to you. Uh... <sighs> yeah, uh... <laughs> 
when I say it like that, it's really sad. But uh, then I look back at the the uh, uh, the radar chart for diversity, the pa the diversity power ranking system, and and I laugh again. Ha ha ha. So there was an artist who, a uh, character artist who works at Overwatch named Melissa Kelly. <laughs> she replied, oh God, she replied to this fucking thing. She, she goes, God, I swear our own company tries so hard to slaughter any goodwill the actual devs who make the game have built. Overwatch doesn't even use this creepy dystopian chart. Our writers have eyes. The artists have eyes. Producers, directors, etc. As far as I know, also all have eyes. You know what drives... Uh, she continues. You know what drives our diversity? The devs. We have people who work on the game from these cultures. That's it. That's literally it. If these, if this creepy chart was made for the executive team to let us do our thing, that might track. And then a follow-up of a meme. It says, zero days since last, our studio ruining our reputation. Uh, oh, shit. This comes hot off the heels of, new, of news about the Raven Union. They've been mailing in their votes on forming a union, and apparently, apparently there was a company email. I totally forgot about it. There was a company email that said, uh, "Please vote no." <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming most of them voted yes. Oh yeah, management at the company. This is from Shannon Lau, who I think we've read from before. Management at the company sent an email to employees asking them to please vote no. They still voted yes! Let's go. Shoutouts to Raven. Hopefully you'll be treated like actual fucking employees. <laughs> Holy cannoli, dude. This is... So someone said this thing that was so accurate. This is so accurate. Like, a, I heard this a few years ago. I think when the Blitzchung thing happened with the free Hong Kong thing, someone went like... Because, like, immediately after, like, a week afterwards, they announced, like, Soldier 76 is gay. You're like, what? Okay. Um, that, like, Blizzard, like, <laughs> every time they get into a controversy, they just announce to get their PR back. They just announce that another character from Overwatch is gay. <laughs> Holy shit. They're just, like, they, it's, like, Blizzard fucking kills babies. <laughs> And then a week later, it's like, did you? Yeah, Winston has crazy hot man on gorilla sex with like other men, like male human beings. He's like a super fucking kinky. <laughs> He's a super gay gorilla. <laughs> Isn't that cool, guys? Isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> holy shit i wonder i feel like this was a tactical decision like there was no reason that you guys had to talk about this you did not need to tell us about this you did not need to share that but you did and i wonder if it was to cover up uh this union thing anyway while i were on the subject congrats to raven for at least voting yes on their union um Everyone, I feel like at this point it's pretty well established that I'm pretty pro-union for the games industry, yada, yada, yada. I know that it can be done poorly, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot more workers' protection uh, for people who work in games. I have been following this industry since I was, like, 11 or 12. And uh, it is... Uh, really shameful the way that a lot of companies treat their employees and a lot of it just comes down to like poor management um yeah i think it's fucking time i think it's time that something like this happens i hope they're successful with what they do um yeah uh one final story because my throat is getting a little 
tired. A week after selling its Western Studios, Square Enix says it will establish or buy new ones. And comes to us from VGC, courtesy of Andy Robinson. So, if you recall, I think last week. <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, last week. Uh, Square sold off a, bun a bunch of their old IPs. A bu oh, sorry. IPs and studios. Pretty much all the Western ones. Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal... Square Enix Montreal, they sold off Square Enix, they sold off Deus Ex. And uh, they put out their financial results on Friday. And uh, it says they're basically, they took the money that they got from there and they're going to expand <clears throat> to new businesses. They're just going to ex expand their thing, expand the blockchain, AI, and the cloud. Uh, supposedly something about creating new IPs, speeding up decision-making through an integrated group management, Jesus Christ, and boosting game development capabilities by establishing new studios. So, I'm assuming this means that they're going to start, like, some shitty mobile studios and they're going to pump out some NFT games. And, uh, it's going to be really bad. I'm assuming they will fail. And Final Fantasy XIV will bail them out. Because, along with that story, came the story that last year, Square's profits, despite a number of total failures, uh, jumped 90%. 90%. 90%. And most of that had to do with Final Fantasy XIV. Which, mind you... It's so funny. It's so fu This is the difference. This is the difference between intelligence and no. This is the difference between like education and wisdom. <laughs> I feel like intelligence has some measure of wisdom in it. This is the measure of ed the difference between education and wisdom. Because square I feel like I've, I I've talked about this previously. Square, it's it's like I it's ironic. It's actually like it's actually ironic. Square puts out these projects that are just garbage, that are just awful, or just kind of fail. Um, they just fail out because they try to like overly monetize them. They just they handle it in like the worst possible way to try and squeeze as much money out of the consumer without making a game that's actually worth people's time. I heard Guardians of the Galaxy was actually pretty good. I, I heard decent things about Outriders, right? And those games didn't do too great. I'm thinking about Babylon's Fall. I'm thinking about... I, I don't know why Guardians of the Galaxy didn't do too well. Maybe it was marketing? I have no idea. Um, but, like... They keep repeating this process. I mean, they do that horrible fucking Chocobo Grand Prix thing. That was just incredibly disgusting monetization. With the, like, free currency, right? You know, like, every game has, like, the paid currency and the free currency. Well, the free currency expires in that game. Can you believe that? Jesus Christ. Um, they... And, like, while they're doing this, all this scummy, stupid, short-sighted stuff, they are sitting... They continuously get bailed out of their bad decisions by Final Fantasy XIV, which is a game that explicitly... That goes to great pains to respect the player, their time, and their money. When you boot up fourteen. It does not ask you for a cent. You start up the game. That's it. You're in the game. It It's so nice. It's so nice. It feels like when I play 14, like, even... I've never met any of the devs, but I feel like they respect me. And that's a really nice feeling to have when you're playing a game. As big as an MMO, right? 
I f there's like a positive energy to the game that is just it's difficult to pin down but it's just it's just in the little things like there's places that are just you know meant to have fun there's little mini games and side games and there's no like it there's a, an extreme lack of cynicism in 14 and it has single-handedly boosted their profits by 90 percent you would think you would think that they would get the memo now but no this is the difference between having like a business degree and being actually like being actually like wise and understanding of of what is going on like if you make a good game and you market it properly people will buy it maybe i can't say again because you know i don't I, I really didn't pay that much attention to guardians of the galaxy I don't know what the marketing was like, but I heard it was good. I hope it makes its money back if it was good. It seemed cool. It seemed like a solid action game. <sighs> Maybe you're not like a guaranteed sell, right? It's not a guaranteed success. I should advise that. There's games that were good that I think were marketed properly that were probably bad. Or, sorry, that sold poorly or something like that. But, like, it's worth, how would I put it? It's worth doing it the right way, so to speak. Because longer term, it's better for everyone. And I honestly think you have a better chance of success. Like, okay. Uh, you have a better chance of success, I think, if you if you if you make a good game and market it properly. It's not guaranteed, but I think like it, it you have a higher success rate. But in the, even if it fails, how many games are there that were only appreciated like years after they came out? I mean it took like years for spec ops to be appreciated. Like, that's a game that maybe did not sell well when it first came out but like in the long run like it may very well have made its money back there's probably a lot of games that have done that that have didn't do that well but in the long run made their money back or at least broke even compared to sonic 4 i just saw a video about sonic 4 today i i, I remembered that it existed which is, like, kind of forgettable, and, like, it's just, it's just shitty enough. Like, it just kind of blows. It just kind of sucks. I remember playing that, and I was like, this does not feel good. Who's gonna come back to that? It's been ten years since that game came out. Is anyone coming back to that? Not really, but people still come back to Spec Ops. Because people talk about it, and they're like, this game was, like, really cool, and it did some really interesting things for the time. It actually, Spec Ops is a game that actually fits, like, into the canon of video games in a very interesting way. And you don't get that when it's just a soulless cash grab game, right? Like, maybe, the, maybe it'll survive as an example, but, like, how many people are actually going to play it? Yeah, it's... Go play 14. Go check out the free trial. The game is finally playable. <laughs> um, if, if you're a free trial player. Uh, it's great. It's made by devs who really care. Go invest in it to support it. Honestly. Honestly. I would... If you, like, want to support it, it's... It, it is actually an extremely unproblematic investment. As opposed to, like, I'm going to buy something from EA. You're like, ah, do I want to give money to EA? I would give money to Square for Final Fantasy XIV just to make just to make a point. Cause like they deserve it. It's a great game. The developers are great. They're treated very well. Uh, they work fucking five-hour days, <laughs> and they still pump out like 
<laughs> like one of the best MMOs on the market. Oh, yeah. Well, we're closing in on about an hour and a half. And my throat is tired and my tongue hurts on one side because I think I bit into it. So I'm going to be bidding a Jew. If you've been listening to this far, thank you so much for listening. Uh, it has been a, it's been a pleasure. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I will happily get to them next time. Uh, but please remember to phrase it in the form of a question because I don't want to read your thoughts out loud. That's what I say at the end of these. <laughs> Go watch the latest video on Make My Video, the weird FMV series. And, uh, yeah, have a good one. Goodbye.